Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be going through the whole of Edexcel GCSE Biology Genetics. So we're going to be looking at some quite in-depth things like DNA, protein synthesis, genes and alleles and loads of other stuff. If you'd like to follow along with this video, over on my website you can download my biology notes. Okay, so there are two types of reproduction, sexual and asexual. Sexual reproduction is good because it means the species will have genetic variation. And this means that organism can easily adapt to changes in the environment. By having genetic variation, this means there is more chance that the organism will randomly have a mutation that can help them survive in different situations. However, sexual reproduction takes a long time. For example, in humans, pregnancy lasts nine months. And then you also need to find a mate. This is a big problem in endangered species because if there are only a few animals left it can be hard for them to find each other to mate. Asexual reproduction is good because it's very fast, which means it's easy to replenish the population. However it produces genetically identical organisms, which then means they can be more susceptible to disease. If they're all identical and one of them is susceptible to a certain disease, then it means they all are. If the population of that organism then get infected, all of them could die. So meiosis is a type of cell division, and it creates the gametes, so the sex cells. Now meiosis is similar to mitosis, but it has a couple of differences. The first difference is that it's, it's going to produce four cells instead of just two and these are all going to be genetically different. Where in mitosis they're genetically identical. These cells are also going to be haploid, and this means they have half the number of chromosomes to a normal cell. This is so that when the two gametes fuse together during fertilization they have the full number. So before meiosis even starts, DNA replication needs to happen. So the cell's going to make double of all its chromosomes. Now it begins with just one arm, and then it duplicates it by adding another arm of this chromosome. However, it's held together by this centromere in the middle. Now we count chromosomes by the centromere, so even though it's duplicated, we still say we only have one chromosome. Now after it's replicated, the chromosomes are going to move away to each end of the cell. Now this is different to mitosis because in mitosis the chromatids move away and a chromatid is just one half of the chromosome so it splits apart. In meiosis the chromosomes move to each end of the cell. Now this is when the first division happens and we say first because there are two divisions when meiosis happens. So we start at the top with eight chromosomes and eight chromatids and remember that a chromatid is just one half of the chromosome. These duplicate so that we still have eight chromosomes because we count them by the centromere in the middle, but we have 16 chromatids. The cell then divides into two cells, so in each cell so we have one over here and one over here. We have four chromosomes and eight chromatids. You don't need to remember how many chromosomes and chromatids are in each stage because it changes with each organism, but I'm just showing you so that you can see what happens during each step. Now after the cells divide the first time, the chromatids are going to move away to each end of the cell. So make sure you remember that the first time it divides, the chromosomes move away, and the second time it divides, the chromatids move away. The cells divide again, meaning that we have four chromosomes, and four chromatids in each of the four cells. So we have four genetically different haploid cells. Now this is a reduction division because we start with eight chromosomes and we end up with four chromosomes. So we've reduced the number and this happens because of these two divisions. So DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid and the DNA is stored as chromosomes in the nucleus of our cells. DNA has a double helix shape, which looks something like this. DNA is a giant polymer, 
which means a long molecule, almost like a chain made up of different parts. Each part of the DNA is called a nucleotide. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, which is called deoxyribose, and a base. So this is one nucleotide. And then you can see over on this picture here that these nucleotides join together and then repeat in units. Now these bases are really important in DNA. There are four different types of bases, A, T, C and G. Now these pair together so you can see that on the left we have one base and on the right we have the other. A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. Between A and T there are two hydrogen bonds and between C and G there are three hydrogen bonds. Now the order of these bases is unique to every single person and these are coded instructions. And these instructions tell your body to make different proteins to then show different characteristics. So the process of making these proteins is called protein synthesis. And there are two parts to this. The first is transcription. And this all happens in the nucleus. So we have our cell, and then in the nucleus of the cell we have our DNA, which is the coded instructions. So let's say this DNA has the base order of A, T, C, C, G, A. And what's first going to happen is a molecule called mRNA is going to come a bond to this DNA. Now we know that A always bonds with T and C always bonds with G. Now mRNA is slightly different. Instead of using T, it's going to use U. This is really important when talking about protein synthesis. mRNA uses U. A goes with U. T goes with A. C goes with G. C then goes with G again. G goes with C. And A goes with U. So this is the first step. mRNA is going to come a bond with the DNA to make a copy of the order. Now this mRNA is then going to go and travel out of the nucleus to go find a ribosome. Now this is the second step, this is where translation happens. So once this molecule of mRNA arrives at the ribosome, another molecule called tRNA is going to come. Now tRNA is going to read these bases in groups of three, and we're going to call these groups of three codons. Now the tRNA molecule brings an amino acid with it. So depending on what three bases they are, it will bring a different amino acid. The tRNA leaves the amino acid behind and then goes to pick up another one to read a different codon. After reading the whole molecule of our mRNA, these amino acids build up to form a long chain, which then creates a protein. So a gene is a section of DNA and it usually codes for a certain characteristic. An allele is then a different version of a gene. So you have two alleles for every single gene in your body. One from mum and one from dad. For example, if your mum passed down the gene for blue eyes and your dad passed down the gene for brown eyes. So if you look at this diagram of chromosomes, the one from mum and one from dad, you can see that at the bottom there are different alleles for a gene. And they can either be homozygous or heterozygous for these genes. Homozygous means you have the same two alleles. So if mum passed down blue eyes and dad passed down blue eyes. And then heterozygous means you have different alleles. So if mum passed down blue eyes and dad passed down brown eyes. Now these alleles can also be dominant or recessive. Dominant alleles override recessive. So if we show dominant alleles with a capital letter and recessive alleles with a, with a lowercase letter. If the person has one dominant allele and one recessive allele, the dominant allele will overpower the recessive one, meaning that the dominant trait will be shown. However, if the person has two recessive alleles, they work together and mean that the recessive trait is shown. Blue eyes is a dominant allele, and brown eyes is a recessive allele. All of the different alleles you have, so your entire DNA, is your genotype. 
and then the alleles that show is your phenotype. So if mum passed down blue eyes and dad passed down brown eyes, both would be your genotype. However, only blue eyes would be your phenotype because that's the dominant one. If both parents passed down brown eyes, then both brown alleles would be your genotype and brown would be your phenotype because the recessive worked together to show. So we can use Punnett squares to predict what alleles will come together. So when we draw these diagrams, you use capital letters to show dominant alleles and lowercase letters to show recessive. They can be any letter of your choice. We're going to use the letter A. So if person 1 passed down a dominant allele and a recessive allele, and person 2 passed down two recessive alleles, we can see how they'll come together. We can draw this table to show what alleles their offspring will potentially have. So we're going to bring each letter down like this. So this square will have one capital A and a lowercase a. This square will have two lowercase a's. This square will have a capital A and a lowercase a. And then this square will have two lowercase a's. So if I take away all of these arrows, we can see that the first square is going to show the dominant characteristic. The second square will show the dominant characteristic. And then these two squares will show the recessive characteristic. Now we have four squares, so each square is worth 25%. So we can use this to say that there is a 25% chance of each of these scenarios happening. So cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. So people with two recessive alleles will have the disease. So the first person has a dominant allele and a recessive allele, and then the second person has two dominant alleles. Now to show this trait, you need to have two recessive alleles. However, if you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, you can still carry the disease. So I'll quickly fill out this Punnett square, and then we can have a look if this disease will be passed on or not. So for the disease to be passed on, we need to look for someone who is recessive and a homozygous. So this means someone with two recessive alleles. So the first one both has dominant. So it's not the first one because both alleles are dominant, so it won't show the disease. Or the second one. Or the third one because it's got a dominant and a recessive. Or the fourth one. So the disease is not passed on. However, this person and this person carry the disease because they have a recessive allele. So the first person to look at different genes was Mendel, and he used pea plants to look at this. He bred a short pea plant and a tall pea plant together. He then noticed that their offspring were all tall. He then bred them again and realised that there were three tall and one short plant. He then realised that they must have had different genes to pass this on. So if I draw a Punnett square to show this. So this Punnett square shows that the first one will be tall because it's got these two dominant alleles. The second one will be tall because it's still got a dominant allele. The third one will be tall because it's got this dominant allele. But the fourth one has two recessive, so it will be short. And this directly represents what was shown when you bred them the second time. Three tall plants and one short. So this would mean that these four plants must have had these genotypes with one tall allele and one short allele. So variation is the differences in populations. So variation can be genetic or environmental. So genetic variation is caused by the alleles. And then environmental variation is caused by the surroundings. So some examples of genetic variation is eye colour or hair colour, but some environmental variation could be if the person has tattoos, if they've dyed their hair, if they've got piercings, or the type of clothes they wear. Another place you can see this variation is if you grew a plant. If the plant was naturally tall based on its genetics, but you kept it in a dark cupboard and didn't water it, it wouldn't be able to reach this height. So the genetics can say how much it can reach it, but the environment can see if it can reach that potential or not. If this video helped with your biology revision, please subscribe to my channel and check out some of the other videos I have.